you know, I don't know what the exact little details are, but there's no limit to what, it's post 9-11, the police can do what they want. So it's a bad time to be a criminal in America. There's no more godfather bullshit, you know, it's, it's, this is the real deal. The cops can do what they want. If you want to go to jail, be a criminal. Yes. I had no idea that they were doing this, though, until you were caught, and no. they revealed it to you, right? Or Actually, no. I, I thought... You didn't have a surveillance system. Uh, out. When he's talking about the surveillance system, that was his cameras on his house shooting at the street. Yeah, and I, I was watching them watch me, and I thought I had it all be, you know, I thought I was so smart. I, uh, I had a, a briefcase where I kept all my drugs, and on the briefcase it said, you know, uh, attention. This briefcase is en route to my attorney. It's covered by attorney-client privilege, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my attorney, the Tom Retainer. You know, and, and that actually worked one time, like a year and a half before. I had a disgruntled girlfriend. <laughs> Cops showed up at my place, and the girlfriend said, He's a drug dealer. He's got a box of drugs under the bed. It's labeled to his lawyer. He doesn't think you can get in. Now, these are normal patrol cops. You've got to remember, cops have got a rule book this thick, you know, just like any job. They don't know every rule and every nook and cranny of the law. They're not lawyers. They're cops, and God bless them. But I said to these cops, you know, they said, hey, we want to bring the dog in. She says, you've got a big box of meth under the bed. It's marked to your lawyer, and you don't think we can get in it. And I said... Well, you can't. It's to my lawyer. You need to leave now. And they did. <laughs> so what'd that do? That put me on number one hit list. So <laughs> That pissed off a lot of cops, for one. Number two, made me think I was untouchable. <laughs> That's when I should have stopped right then. You know, but I didn't. You know, they left. So then the detective squad gets involved. I remember when they came to my house, I said, hey, man, that's to my lawyer. You can't get into that. I'm like, yeah, whatever, kid. <laughs> Zip. <laughs> Took it out. You know, now that they've got it in their hands, it doesn't matter. You know, they've got half a kilo of meth in a peanut butter jar. And they're like, oh, what do we have here? There's a big old jar of meth. Oh, what's this? A loaded 357 in the same briefcase. That's bad. <laughs> I was like, oh, that is bad, isn't it? You know. And <laughs> so. <laughs> Real bad, you know, and, uh, you know, but I'm glad they busted me. I'm glad I'm going to prison because I'm finally clean. I'd rather be me right now, clean, finally on the right track, done with drugs and crime, than me the last few years of doing meth. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Do the feds have an option on this? Is this like, you know, the rob option? The state busts you. Then what they say, they have an option to pick up the piece here? Yeah. So let's pick up on this? Or, the feds can or, always pick up any well, case. Let's throw this, this uh, parolee in, the, in, the, in his class with him to get him thrown out. Well, thing, and then we'll pick him up. <laughs> I don't know if that's why I got picked up. I don't know. That might have just been a coincidence. I don't think it helped at all because I was scared. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah, they, they can, can pick you up. The well, feds can do whatever they want. They can pick up case. a case anytime they want. And what they did was, you see, I didn't know how pure my dope was. I didn't you know even really. why they can do that? Because they're the federal government? Yeah. But besides that. Why? Well, basically the reality, when you're busted for possession for distribution of a controlled substance, right? Yeah. So you had a Schedule II drug, okay? And the, we, we haven't gotten to the laws part of that, okay? But for Schedule I drugs, which are basically illegal, Schedule II drugs, there is a medical use for them you have to have a license, a government license, oh. to do it. You were distributing without a government license. No matter where you got it. That's what you got busted for. So that's why they can come in, because federal law supersedes state <laughs> on certain things. That's why they can decide, you know, well, we're not looking for little, we're not looking for balls. Yeah. <laughs> we're looking for keys or more. We want powder on the table because, you know, we can prove there's a clear and present danger to the community and, you know, unlicensed weapons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they can jump in at any time because you're violating federal law and they can decide, yeah. okay, when are you a big enough fish that we want to deal with you? Purity, too, is what my lawyer yeah. said. I threw the whole getting kicked out of treatment theory at my lawyer. He's like, actually, he goes, you know, we... You see, instead of pushing for a quick and speedy trial so they wouldn't have had time to test it, we were holding off because I had no idea it was as pure as it was. 
Uh, you know, I just, I just you know. Why? Uh, I just didn't know, you know. I mean, I was actually quite a rookie. I don't have any cops or criminals in my family. I tried this whole criminal thing all on my own. Nobody was there to show me the ropes, you know. So I didn't know it was as pure as it was. The feds did test it. The DEA got a hold of a sample of it, tested it, and said, whoa, this is 98% pure. This is half a kilo. We're going to pick up this case. And that's what they did. <laughs> yes? Um, I'm from Thurston, too, and I know, like, when you walk in the grocery store, you see, like, 10 people you know. I was wondering, like, do you ever see people out in, like, the community that you've, like, dealt to? Or, like, and how is that, like, is it weird? Like, is it it's, 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 it's an opportunity for me to invite them to a meeting. You know, I'd like to just run to them and take them and put them in my car and take them to a meeting. Mm -hmm. But I, I can't yet. Uh, I don't got enough time under my belt, you know. Um, so I just say, you know, you guys, this whole recovery thing, this whole thing, it works. You know, you guys should meet me at a meeting, you know, and I'll hand them a meeting list or something. And I'll be like, come on. And I just pray for them. You know, that's one of the most powerful things I can do is pray. Uh, it's been working miracles in my life. Um, and I know that if, if I'm going to prison, it's because that's where God wants me, you know. He wants me there to be, you know, a positive influence on the people in there maybe, you know. For some reason, I know that. I can just, it's all in his hands, you know. It's, it's not in my hands. It's not my choice to make. So, yeah. I just invite him to a meeting and pray for him. Yes. If you weren't going to prison and didn't have any restrictions and could do whatever you want, you know, have your freedom, would you be able to stay sober? Absolutely. There's so many reasons why I never want to go back to active addiction. You know, one, I don't ever want to be in this kind of legal situation again. Um, where people can poke at you with a stick, basically. You know, my whole life, the whole time I've known Mike, you know, we, 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 we hung out in a place where, you know, somebody's giving you a hard time. You say, are you antagonizing me? You know, and if they continue to do it, you know, that's, you get it on. You know, we don't play. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, you, you, are you trying to upset me? You know, let's fight. You know what I mean? So my whole life, now, I got in trouble like this, and, uh, all of a sudden, I got a bunch of grown men, counselors. Mainly, there's some good and there's some bad counselors out there. Okay? You got people that just, they can do whatever they want because they know there's nothing you can do. If I ever lay my hands on somebody again, I'm in deep do. I'm already in deep do. So that's, I, I got I to come up and formulate a whole new way of living and, and putting up with people, which is probably a good <coughs> thing. You know? Learn how to be a, a, a gentler, kindler man. Um, yeah, yeah, a nicer guy, you know? Uh, and, and I don't know how well that will play out in prison. You know, I might have to take a step back in terms of the whole, you know, what, you know, where, how I carry myself and step back into the, you know, don't mess with me mode. But um, I also don't ever want to put my family through this again, you know. I don't ever want to have to go back to treatment. I don't ever, you know, I don't want to see the meth monsters and the shadow people and the voices I mean, I was having auditory hallucinations there at the end. It was just as clear as me and you were talking right now, you know, voices. Oh, they've all disappeared, you know, all the shadow people and meth monsters and voices and paranoia. And, and the truth is, if one of you guys are a cop and you're here to watch me, cool. I don't care now because I'm not a criminal anymore. So, I mean, I, I look at everybody. Are you an undercover? Are you a confidential informant? You know, you're judging everybody that way when you're walking around with a life sentence in your pocket. You know what I mean? So it's nice to not have that paranoia, you know. I, I don't ever want to go back to it, and I never will. And if I didn't have to go, let's say I would have got a suspended sentence where, you know, they said, okay, Rob, you got 10 years. If you screw up even once, we're throwing you in. We're not even going to give you a trial. What I do is go back to school, get a job, write a book. Now I'm just going to do all three of those things, but I'm going to do it in confinement, you know, have a job, work, school. Yeah going to hang out with um, after you serve your term because a lot of the people you hung out with before were addicts and so on that you were dealing to. Who's, who's your hangout crowd now? Well, the good thing about the program, 12-step um, programs, is, you know, that's already who I've been hanging out with, is people that are in recovery, people that are in the 12-step programs. There's a meeting every morning, at least a couple different kinds. There's a meeting every day at noon, a couple different kinds. And there's like five or six meetings every night, starting at five, and then another one at six, another one at seven, another one at eight, of two different kinds quite often. So, like, I can hit, you know, right now, I quit my job when I got sentenced on January 3rd, so I could spend the last month just doing recovery, and that's what I do now. 
I go to recovery afterwards, maybe a group of us will go have breakfast. And then I go to a noon meeting afterwards, maybe we'll go have lunch. And then I'll throw in a presentation at a high school.